sold the tickets today. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce the speaker today, uh, Roy Carlson. I've known Roy for a little bit of time. I think 1974 was when I showed up and first met Roy. And he had the pleasure of telling me that my supervisor, who I was at SFU, uh, Tom McKernan, died. <laughs> so uh, ultimately, uh, Roy uh, became my supervisor. and. Uh, I moved on from there, and I'm so grateful. We have Roy to blame. <laughs> What's that? We have Roy to blame. We have Roy to blame. Yeah. Um, uh, Roy is uh, a special individual in the department. He, in fact, founded the department in 1971. He's a charter member of the SFU faculty. He came here in 1965. Uh, Roy's had a, a fairly substantial career. Uh, Primarily on the Northwest Coast, as we all know, both in terms of Northwest Coast art and, and prehistory, but he's had a lot of different streams uh, over the years, um, including Paleo-Indian materials, uh, um, his PhD dissertation uh, is on uh, the Southwest and the volume that he wrote uh, and published on that, and White Mountain Redware continues to be cited and, you know, sort of on an annual basis. So. Uh, he's done many different things. Roy has his undergraduate and MA degree from the University of Washington. Undergraduate there. Yeah. University of Washington. Uh, so he, and then went on to the University of Arizona, PhD. So I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I really appreciate about Roy is he's one of the smartest administrators I have ever met. And, uh, uh, <laughs> He, he managed to do things back in the day that just could not be done uh, anymore. So uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Roy. I see he's got some of his artifacts to show us, as he always does. Um, and uh, uh, he's going to be speaking to us today about a project he did before he came to SFU. So. Oh, well, thank you, Dave. <laughs> Well, actually, these sites I'm going to talk about today, I excavated 50 years ago. Now, to a lot of you, 50 years is like prehistory. <laughs> so anyway, I'll get on with it. Now, as a teenager, when you first discover archaeology, what intrigues you? Well, this is treasure hunting. You're getting something for nothing. Of course, everybody wants to get something for nothing. But then as you grow older and get into archaeology, at least in my day, archaeology became problem solving. Really not a heck of a lot different doing a jigsaw puzzle. And the problems in those days were cultural historical problems. You wanted to see where what you excavated fit in terms of world prehistory. You wanted to know what gaps there were. You wanted to promote various cultural historical models. And so this was the kind of problem solving you do, did. Mind you, there were also all kinds of practical problems in doing archaeology, but you can always solve those. Um, I never intended to become an old world archaeologist. I had, I think, 12 seasons field work working on the northwest coast, in the southwest, in the Great Basin. But when you're teaching something, really, at a university level, you should have first hand experience in it. I was at the University of Colorado at the time, and they had had a three year project in Nubia in the Aswan Reservoir, the reservoir created by the Aswan High Dam. But the guys that were running it decided we're not going back. And so Gordon Hughes and Pete Robinson and I got together and decided, well, we'll go back. So we applied for our NSF grant, which we received, and they made me be field director, which pleased me to no end although I'd never had any experience, really, in the old world. The Aswan High Dam project was really a huge salvage project. 
I don't think there's been one of that magnitude since, that there were expeditions from countries all over the world. Uh, and of course, many of them were working on the uh, Egyptian uh, dynastic statues and things. But we applied for a concession to do prehistoric archaeology along the Baton el Hajar, the belly of stone that is just south of the second cataract on the Nile. So in 64, 65, we went over and did survey, came back, wrote it up, asked for more money from the National Science Foundation, which we received. And so I went back in 1965. In fact, I came here to SFU. We attended the open ceremony, and I took off a week later for Egypt and the Sudan. Now, the impetus, let's turn the lights off here. Yeah. For, right, er, for giving this seminar today is the fact that I finally wrote this stuff up. <laughs> and it was published in December by uh, British Archaeological uh, Reports in Oxford. Now, there are several reasons why it did not get written up before. That we returned from the Sudan in 1966, where I began teaching here at SFU, laid out all of the Paleolithic artifacts in my lab here. But things, well, it took about a year and a half for them to get here. That's the um, people in the Sudan kept looking for a boat to go to Colorado. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we finally solved that problem. It's called uh, Bakshish. <laughs> that, uh, you know, the holier than now North Americans, where backsheesh is not openly part of their culture, is simply the way you get things done when you're in the old world. So uh, the uh, artifacts finally arrived here in uh, late 67. And so I got them all laid out in my lab and was just starting the analysis when things went to hell here at SFU. That uh, there was open revolution. There were those of us on one side who believed in objectivity, scientific method, and that who achieved progress through those two things. On the other side, in the same department, or a bunch of socio-ideologues who believed the only way you could achieve progress was by revolution. And quoting old men like uh, Chairman Mao and Karl Marx and things like that. Anyway, it soon became clear that archaeology could not survive in that department. So uh, we moved it out and created a department of archaeology. Now, here's the Nile. This is the Aswan Dam. Our, this is where our concession was on the west bank of the Nile. Then after the survey in 64, we met with the commissioner for antiquities in Khartoum and told him which sites we wanted to excavate. He wasn't very interested. He said he wanted to, us to excavate this site down here, Kor Abu Anja at Khartoum, which he believed was the most important Paleolithic site in the Sudan and was being destroyed by dube pickers, by miners who were digging um, clay and silt to build houses and to make gardens. So, in uh, 65, when we left here, we went uh, and excavated the sites here, Awandi, Korsheba, Wadi Karagan, and we found a new site, 11H9, Magandoli.
Well, we flew first to Cairo. Well, actually, we stopped in uh, France, and I stayed a week with Francois Bourde while I looked at his collection of Paleolithic artifacts. And then we went on and flew along the Nile to Port Sudan and Khartoum. There we picked up our vehicles, a Land Rover and a VW bus that we had borrowed from the State Department. We hired a foreman and a cook and his family. We collected all our supplies, purchased food and other things, put them on a flatbed car on the train, headed across the desert for Wadi Halfa. Wadi Halfa was a mess. It was mostly underwater by then. The airport was still above water, and people still had all their belongings hanging around there. Well, this is what Wadi Halfa looked like, the, the old city before. Lake Nasser was flooding it. Then we drove down the Nile on Kitchener's old railroad bed to arrive at these villages in Nubia, which were partly depopulated by that time. You can see one of the villages here and the fields in front. We moved into a house. Uh, the male sex symbols there mean the house has been paid for and the inhabitants have been moved to Kashim el Jerba, which is on the Atbara River. So we moved in. The members of um, the crew from North America were one of my students, Steve Sigstad, and his wife. Uh, my family, Catherine, Daniel, Arne, Christopher, and my wife, Maureen. Now, those of you who have families, take them to the field. It does them good. <laughs> <laughs> the inhabitants of some of these villages were not happy to leave, that uh, this village was being loaded, these were being loaded up on trucks to take them south. And some of them refused to move, actually. And they didn't like leaving their graveyards behind. The Bedouins from the desert were already moving in, and when the village was depopulated, they moved right in. The government had torn out the water wheels, which uh, contributed the water from the Nile for farming, and some of the people put back the shaduf which is a water lifting device to irrigate their fields. Life in Nubia wasn't bad. We rather liked our mud house we were living in. Um, we had to drink Nile water. The water was brought on the uh, water donkey from the Nile, and it also served for the boys to ride. They didn't allow girls on donkeys, but uh, Kathy had a pretty good time with the women of the village. Didn't you, Kathy? <laughs> yes. Now, in 64, when we first went over, our grant came through two weeks before we were scheduled to leave. And so uh, we had to have this iron boat built in Khartoum. And then we, uh, again, brought it up to the Nile, and that's what we used for crossing the Nile. All the sites we wanted to excavate were on the west bank, where we were living on the east bank. Um, we took some days off. We hired a felucca that took us downriver to uh, one of the uh, Egyptian sites then came back. However, some of these boats weren't too uh, stable, so we were glad we had our own boat. 
The first site we excavated was Wadi Karagan, that in the previous season we had found Paleolithic artifacts scattered around here, so we put in a series of test trenches to try and see where they were coming out. And we didn't find any Paleolithic uh, stuff, but we did find a uh, remains of a house here and uh, pottery, a few stone tools that dated to 3000 BC. And we tried to avoid pulling a Cleopatra by avoiding those sorts of things. <laughs> then we excavated um, two C group sites, which are shown here. C group dates to about 1500. Uh, 1700, 2000 BC, in that time period. These are the types of artifacts from the C group sites. Now we knew it was C group because of that small lion seal up in the corner there. And I took it to uh, IES Edwards at the British Museum, who identified it as C group. So you had no radiocarbon dates from these sites. Now, if any of you are looking for thesis projects <laughs> that uh, preliminary reports, I published these <coughs> years ago, but final reports on the C group material has never been written. It's now in the museum here. So if any of you are interested, talk to Barbara Winter. There's some rock art there, probably C group, but uh, there are no giraffes in the area these days, but uh, perhaps they were then. I can never decide whether these were sickles or fly whisks. We found an additional site to the C group sites. We were out uh, hiking one uh, Sunday. And we went up to the top of this jebel on the west bank of the river, which was covered everywhere, Paleolithic artifacts. Never been recorded. But I thought, well, this is really what we're looking for. And so I decided to excavate there. Uh, well, easiest way to get up was to haul all our equipment up the sand dune to the top. And there, at the very top, there was a ruined structure. However, this was C group, not, not Paleolithic. It had already been recorded and partly excavated by some other expedition. I didn't even notice that there were Paleolithic artifacts all over the surface of the place. They must have been classical archaeologists of some sort. <laughs> but Magandoli translates as house down. And we think it's this structure that gave the Jebel its name. Now, Angandoli turned out to be a quarry site. But, uh, the people living here were uh, quarrying uh, the uh, bedrock, really, to make tools. That here is a profile of one of our uh, squares, trenches. These are all pieces of lithics, flakes, cores, tools, everything. Also, if you look up there, it was cold in there in the winter. I'll tell you, this may be the desert, but it's not all that warm. So we put in this one trench here near the south end of the site. The artifacts are really what's called a Tyrian. Uh, you know, a Tyrian culture has been known for a long time in North Africa. You find uh, Lavalwa, uh, cores such as those here, and, and flakes, and uh, points. And you find with them stemmed artifacts, which they called pedunculates, which I thought was a hilarious name. But anyway, <laughs> that's what they're called over there. And of course, this dates to the time when hand tools are going out of use, duty hand tools, and hafted tools are coming into use. It's really a major change in lithic technology. 
Uh, we found about 26 Tyrian uh, types there. I won't go into all of them. I've always found scrapers a bit boring. But... <laughs> anyway, worked out the assembly just from top to bottom, and they're really all very similar, so that there was really no discernible culture change during the duration of this occupation. All right. Maxwell made me that nice pie chart. Hi, Dave. <laughs> Anyway, from Magandoli, we proceeded south to Khartoum and Corabo Anja. We loaded all everything we had excavated, all our equipment and vehicles on the train, which goes here from uh, Wadi Halfa across the desert and then follows the Nile down to Khartoum. Now, Corbo Anja is known as a Paleolithic site, that it was investigated initially by A.J. Arkel, who was the Commissioner for Antiquities in the Sudan before it was nationalized. And uh, on the way, we stopped in England uh, to see Arkel, actually. Had an interesting career. After no longer being here, he taught archaeology at the University of London, and then when he was retired from that, he became the vicar of Cuttington, which is a village not too far from London. So we stopped to see Arkel. He'd already uh, provided me with his map of where he had collected things at Corabuanja. And he had published this pamphlet. And uh, Louis Leakey actually reviewed this pamphlet and said, it's not a Shulian at all, it's all Sangoan. Whereas Arkel had worked out a sequence from early through middle through late Shulian, really based on analyzing surface collections. Anyway, our results showed that uh, they were both a little bit right, that there is an Shulian assemblage there, followed by Sangoan and then Lupemban. Now, this is what Corabuanja looks like when you get there. A core is really an arroyo. It's a kind of a gully. That during the rainy season, the lower part of the core was filled with water. And uh, during the wet, er, yeah. But the upper reaches where we decided to work was really pretty dry. And again, one of the dude pickers there who was digging silt and uh, calcareous clay for agriculture and house building. And there were Paleolithic artifacts scattered all over the place. So how do you decide where to dig? Well, we took the surface artifacts and we uh, made we lettered each locality, and then when they were cataloged, why well, uh, indicated the, the locality. So we finally decided to dig in locality A here and locality P at the far northern end of the site. And we did some other smaller test pits in other localities, including one down here on this island that's in the core. And this is the core, which is running from uh, north uh, west to southeast. And this plain is between a village of Umbada and Omdurman. In locality A, there was this pile of rocks. What is it? Well, there are a bunch of Paleolithic artifacts in it. There were some, you know, dew pits nearby. So I decided we would dig there, not particularly because of all of the artifacts in it, but because it was probably undisturbed below this mound. Now, whereas you could have artifacts from really the dew pickers thrown out all over the place. So that was locality A. 
Yeah, well, here, locality A down here, and locality P up there. At locality P, we found more Acheulean artifacts on the surface, in the dube pits, actually, where they had been dug out. And so that's why we excavated up there, that uh, this part right here is a large, thick deposit of um, kaolinite, a white clay. And we thought the Acheulean artifacts were probably coming from that deposit, so that's what we excavated up there. Now, this isn't Olduvai Gorge. You know, some of our deposits are really pretty thin. But still, there was a sequence of, you know, Nubian sandstone, which is the bedrock there, and which they were actually using to make tools, followed by various uh, gravel deposits, and followed by a laminated silt and gravel, and again, a final silt deposit that um, was redeposited in some of the old core beds. The uh, mound of rocks turned out to be a house. We took test pits in some of these other places. And then we excavated below the house. And there was a, uh, we got down to Nubian sandstone in that deeper trench there. But the gravel just overlying it did not have any convincing artifacts in it. Then in locality P, this is the uh, white clay deposit here. We did extensive uh, excavation. We found flakes and things of that sort, but we could not find any hand axes, which was very annoying. But, uh, the locality A made out a composite um, uh, stratigraphic profile. We profiled all of our trenches, but in order to make this intelligible, I made it 20 times the, uh, the vertical uh, extent is 20 times the horizontal extent. Otherwise, it would have been very difficult to actually show this as it is. And our different artifact assemblages came from these different deposits. We had a deposit of white clay here, gravel here, more gravels, silt, modern uh, laminated silt, and so forth and so on. So from this locality, we found 10 different, um, really, stratigraphic units. And <clears throat> These are how they turned out in terms of content. Assemblage one, a few Acheulean artifacts in it. Assemblage two, three, four had lots of Sangoan. Assemblage five was mixed. Six, seven, and nine were Lupemban. And assemblage eight was Lupemban also mixed. As actually a few artifacts in assemblage 10 up there was channel fill. There were a few Lupemban in that. Now, when you have mostly surface things, you have to rely on typology in order to attempt to construct your historical sequence. Now, these are evolved Acheulean hand axes. They really represent a climax of what's almost a million-year-old tradition. But are they effective tools? They're rather large. You're not going to haft them as an arrowhead or a spearhead. They're heavy. 
They're flaked all the way around. You could well cut your hand if you're trying to really do something with them. So what are they? What were they used for? I think that they were demonstrating the flip napper's ability. That's what they are. They're more like art objects than they are effective tools. Now, mind you, all the Acheulean hand axes are not like this, but certainly some of them are. So, anyway, and of course that's in current, with current research on the Acheulean, that uh, what they're doing is, you know, they've looked at these and figured out the complex decision-making required to make one of these hand axes. And so they've got students that they've wired up with electrodes and things like that, and they're trying to determine the actual effect of this decision-making on the brain. Another experiment that's going on that uh, they've been working on is the relationship between tool making and language. And uh, they're developing the hypothesis that tool making and language developed together in prehistory. Now, this is not a new idea. When I was an undergraduate, why my professor said, well, they couldn't possibly have done this without language, wouldn't be able to transmit the information. Well, I don't know if that's true, but anyway, the brain studies are beginning to show that. Now, we have no absolute dates from Karabalanja, but elsewhere, these types of artifacts seem to date between 350,000 and 223,000 years ago. Now, when you're dealing with typology, what do you do with artifacts that don't fit? You always have that problem. Well, there were some here. These were actually excavated. And so I simply called them a, a surely, um, 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 tr transitional. In other words, uh, these are like Sangoan hand axes, but they're larger but they're percussion flaked rather than heavily retouched. This one has some retouch on it, but it's bigger. It's like the Acheulean, the Macokian hand axes of Europe, or the Nubian hand axes of uh, north on the Nile. So I classified them as transitional. I'm not sure I'd do that again, but I might. Anyway, you got them described. And then there are the Sangoan artifacts. And Sangoan is primarily a sub-Saharan technological tradition. And they continued to use really these heavy duty stone tools, which are um, derived probably from Acheulean, uh, core axes, uh, smaller hand axes, picks, and cleavers. And they had some flake tools also. But as you move upward in time in prehistory, flake tools become more common. There are also what uh, Clark and um, Kleindienst call uh, core axes, which are somewhere between a hand axe and a preform. So uh, there are lots of these core axes, some that are kind of wedge-shaped like that, others that are rather rough. And they're typical of the Sangoan. Whoops. And there are Sangoan flake tools. In fact, in the youngest of the Sangoan assemblages, we've got a couple of artifacts that look like they're going to be stemmed. Now, Lupembin. Again, this is the youngest uh, assemblage is at the 